Our scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Just a word of the Lord. A couple weeks ago, we spent some time looking at the reality of our salvation. How there is not less condemnation, but there is no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus. Now, it doesn't matter how much we sin, how much we continually fall short of the glory of God. There is now no condemnation because Jesus Christ died in our place. And the Holy Spirit has united us in Christ's death, so we die to sin. And we have now been freed to live and serve God out of love, out of thankfulness. The Holy Spirit does so much more than, than just save us. He enables us and empowers us to live by faith. So we do not live like how we used to live, according to the counsel and under the control of the sin and our flesh. But now we live in submission and surrender to the Spirit of God who guides us and leads us to follow the Scriptures, producing in us a life of righteousness so we can have peace with God, we have peace with fellow man. See, Christians do not live like the rest of the world. With regards to even the COVID-19, you know, our hope is not in stockpiling resources for ourselves. It's not in our government. It's not in the goodness of humanity. But our hope is in Christ alone, who is with us, who is helping us through all our trials, working in everything for our good, for his glory. See, Christ wants us to deepen our faith. He wants us to have a greater trust in him. He wants us to be in the word and praying more to him. He wants us to grow our love for our neighbor. He wants us to have a greater capacity to love our family. Because otherwise, many of you are stuck at home, but, but otherwise we would all be at work. And in between work, we'd be busy shipping our children from this activity to one other activity, one program to another program. See, God wants us to prioritize loving our families, because that is what God views as important. See, Christians are to be pleasing to God. We are to grow and able to grow in all circumstances because of the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who enables us to live for the glory of God. Today we will see how the Holy Spirit lives in us, how he is life, and how he will raise us to everlasting life. If you're taking notes with me this morning, it's a three-point outline. First, the Spirit lives in you, verse 9. Second, the Spirit is life, verse 10. And third, the Spirit will raise you to everlasting life, verse 11. Now first, as we look at verse 9, we see the Spirit lives in us. But before we get there, we see a huge contrast, a big contrast, to the previous couple of verses where Paul has just described what a mind that is set on the flesh, the mindset of an unbeliever, which is persistently on the things of the earth. This mindset is leading to death, and we know it is hostile to God. It does not submit to God, is not able to submit to God, is not willing to submit to God, does not want to be pleasing to God. Because everything the unbelieving mind thinks upon, dwells upon, it is all in rebellion to Christ as King. You know, even the, the common, you know, the quote-unquote good things that we do, the good things that people do, they're not acknowledged by God because it comes from a heart that loves not God and is done for the wrong motives, the wrong reason. It's not for the glory of God. It's not coming from a heart that is motivated by the love of God. 
See, before anything we do can be acceptable by God, that person, we must be accepted by God. And our acceptance comes only through faith, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, convicting and changing and transforming and saving us. Now, Paul reminds us here in verse 9 that you are no longer in the flesh. You have the Spirit in you. You have been born again by the Spirit. You have laid down your resistance. You have surrendered your life to serve Jesus Christ as King and Lord over your life. You have a new relationship with God. He is no longer your judge and jury and executioner, but now He is your Heavenly Father. You have a new relationship with sin. Before you used to like sin, you wouldn't we perhaps may not like certain kinds of sin, but you love sin. But now you hate sin, and now you war against sin in your life. You are no longer bound and enslaved by your sinful passions, which leads to death. Your mind is no longer even set on the things of the world, which is death. The Spirit has come into you, He has given you new life, He has given you new passions to love Christ, to set your mind on heavenly, eternal, worthwhile things of eternal value. You want to be pleasing to God. You want to be obeying Him and, and loving His Word. You hunger and thirst after righteousness, the song says. You long to be controlled by the Spirit. And you're no longer, in verse 1 we saw in chapter 8, you're no longer condemned. You're no longer under a state of judgment and future judgment, but now you are under a state of grace. See, in all of God's present and future dealings with you, you are now, what underlines it all is, is, is this relationship that we have with God is grace. What underlines everything we have with God is grace, which is his completely undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor that God grants to us because of our faith. Now, when you are born again by the Spirit, as you renounce your sin, you renounce control of your life, saying, I don't want to be king of my life anymore. I want God to be king. You believe in Christ. The Holy Spirit will come into your life. He will live with you. He will dwell with you. you know, we call this the doctrine of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, before he dwells you, first he regenerates your heart. He takes a spiritually dead heart and makes it alive, makes it spiritually alive. We call that the part of being born again. But after being born again, he comes in and dwells your heart. That is, he takes up residency in you. He begins a home renovation project. But to fix up every crooked corner, every, every leaky floor roof, every, you know, drainy, nasty bathroom, every dungeony basement. He fixes up every room in your life, in your heart, so that it is a five-star resort where the Spirit can come and live there that is worthy of the Spirit of Christ. See, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul tells us that we, you, are the temple of the Holy Spirit where the Spirit of God dwells. We are a residence of where the Holy Spirit dwells. And He comes into our life. He transforms us. He leads us. He governs us. He produces the fruit of righteousness, Christ's righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit. We see an increase in love, in joy, in peace patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. We see that once we become a Christian, God gives us a new capacity to love, to have greater joy, and have a spirit of self-control, and etc., and etc. The Spirit comes in and helps us to understand the Bible. He comes in and, and tells us and teaches us who God is. And we, we understand more deeply as we're studying and preaching God's word, what has Christ done for me? And we call this the ministry, you know, the, the theology of the illumination of the Spirit. He illumines our hearts and minds to taste and see and believe and understand the Bible. He helps us to grow in holiness. I mean, He is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is making us less sinful and more like Christ. We call this the ministry of sanctification. 
You know, sixthly, he helps us by praying for us, for even the things that we don't even know that we need. The Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf. He is taking what we need and living it, bringing it up to the throne of God's grace and asking for divine provision to come in and help us to glorify. He helps us when we are in trouble, when we go through times of testing. He is our comforter, our counselor, our advocate. See, and I don't need to tell you these things. You know, anyone who is a Christian can show and tell you this from their life. And we'll all say, hey, we're not where we need to be yet. But by the grace of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit, I am not what I used to be. You know, I am God's masterpiece. But I am a work in progress. It won't be finished until I meet God in heaven. The point that Paul is making here is that the sure evidence that you are a Christian is that the Holy Spirit lives in you. He dwells in you. This is a present tense verb. This means this is an always continual, habitual thing. He continues to live in you. It's not that, you know, the Holy Spirit is not like an occasional uninvited dinner guest who comes into your house and demands food. No, he is a permanent resident in your heart. He comes in, he changes you, he has a seat at your table, and he is there with you always. And just to give you an example, you remember Paul. The Apostle Paul, before he was a Christian, he was a proud Pharisee. He persecuted Christ. He, he killed and imprisoned Christians. But by the grace of God, God saved Saul. You know, an enemy of God, a hater of God, and turned him into the greatest champion of the Christian faith ever. And this is such a dramatic change in his life that God has to change his name from Saul to Paul. And this is what the Holy Spirit has done in all of us who are Christians. He has come into our lives and changed our fundamental nature so that we go through life and we see everything different. Because of Christ, because of his work, the Spirit's work. And secondly, we see in the second sentence in verse 9 that anyone who does not have the Holy Spirit in you is not a Christian. And is still, in fact, living in the flesh, producing the fruit of wickedness, not godliness. Now we all understand that, you know, as Christians, the Spirit can have more or less control of us as we obey and yield to him or disobey and, and refuse him. But all believers have the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit is the sign, is the seal, it is the guarantee of our future inheritance that we belong to God. That's what Paul teaches to us elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Now, being certain of your status in God's kingdom, it's not based upon your, you know, your membership status at a church. Whether you were baptized, whether you've been confirmed, whether you have good works or, you know, you profess to be a Christian. Those may be all good and fine, but what Paul is saying is that what defines, what determines whether you are a Christian or not is whether Christ is in you and you are in him. That is the Holy Spirit living in your life. Because the Holy Spirit is the person who puts us in a real relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is the one who, who, who enables us to have a relationship with God, otherwise we have none. And as the Spirit lives in us, you know, He is giving us assurance that we belong to Him. See, when you see new desires for God, when you see an increasing obedience to God, you see how you used to live and how you live now, how you grow in your love for those who you did not love before. This, they are evidences, supernatural evidences, that God is at work in your life. I want you to also you know, observe here in verse 9, and that sometimes in verse 9, he refers to the, the, Paul refers to the Spirit of God, and then he refers to the Spirit of Christ, and sometimes he just uses capital Spirit, which is, you know, referring to the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, you know, these are all referring to the same divine person, the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some subtle differences in, you know, in, 
know, the relationship and who is the names associated with, but, but Paul wants us to get used to this idea that they all refer to the same person, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us. Now, with regards to the assurance of our salvation, I was reading in a commentary by R.C. Sproul that he categorizes people into four different categories. Now, firstly, there are those who are not saved and they know they're not saved. Secondly, there are those who are saved, they have full assurance of their salvation. And thirdly, there are those who are saved, but they lack the assurance of their salvation. They're not sure. Maybe they're more have a sense of conscience. Maybe they're more prone to, to, to doubt and, and, and question. And fourthly, there are those who are not saved, but they think themselves as saved. These are the ones who have false assurance of salvation. Now, for people can have false assurance for many different ways, but I think two of them are highlighted by R.C. First is that they misunderstand what is required for salvation. Perhaps, you know, you were taught that, you know, all people go to heaven. No one's going to go to heaven. Maybe you think, you know, you know, we're all pretty decent people. God will somehow, you know, look at the, uh, the lens of our lives and kind of normalize out, you know, our lives so that we're more good than bad. We make it. You know, perhaps some of you think, you know, I'm a Christian because, you know, my parents are Christian. I was raised in a Christian home. I went to church. You know, these are not, these may be good and helpful, but they have a wrong understanding of what is required for salvation. Salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. Not of any work that we do. Or rather, perhaps, you know, we may have a wrong evaluation of ourselves. We think we are Christian. We think we, we know what it means to be a Christian. Now, if we were to give you, you know, a test of a doctrine, a statement of faith, what this is all means, you would pass this with flying colors. But like James talks about the demons who have faith in Jesus Christ, but they will not, you know, believe and submit and love him. This is this kind of academic faith that, that, that checks out the right ticks, agrees with the right things, but there's no change of love. There's no change in, in worship and in trusting in Christ you fit under this category, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You will not be able to live out the Christian life. This is the same category of people that Christ says at the end of the Sermon of the Mount to them. You know, the multitudes of people who come and come to him say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus will turn to them and say, depart from me, you, you evildoers. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. People who have self-deception about false assurance. This is why, you know, as we've been studying through Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8, it's been so helpful in helping us clarify and re-clarify what it means to be a Christian and what it means not to be. He keeps putting it in back, black and white terms, contrasting what is right, a Christian, contrasting with what, what, what is not a Christian. Now, I would encourage you, I know we have spent several months preaching through these couple of chapters, but I would encourage you, to get the full sense of what Paul is teaching and writing about, just spend some time this week. Read through Romans 6, 7, 8 in one sitting. Think and meditate. It won't take you more than 10 minutes to read through those three chapters. And think and meditate and try to get the whole argument of what Paul is saying about what does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be in the flesh? Because when you are born again by the Spirit of God, He comes into you and He lives you. That is our first point. The Spirit lives in you. Now as we look at verse 10, we see that the Spirit is life. Paul reminds us of this again in verse 10. We're not of the flesh. Even though our bodies are dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now let's break this down to help us have a better understanding of this. Firstly, who is Paul talking about? He's addressing Christians. Those who have Christ in you. Now, this kind of question whether he asked if Christ is in you is better say, you know, since Christ is in you. Uh, that's a better way to better understand. He's talking about Christians. So, so what does it mean for a Christian, for our body to be dead because of sin? What is he talking about here? Now, he's not talking about spiritual death or, or eternal death because these two categories of death no longer apply to Christians. Now, we were born again 
when we believed in Christ. We received a, a new heart, a heart of flesh, new life, spiritual life. We're no longer spiritually dead. And there is now no more condemnation, no future judgment for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So there's no more eternal judgment or eternal death for Christians either. So the death that Paul is talking about that all Christians will face is physical death, is natural death, where our spirit is separated from our bodies, where it can come through natural aging, cancer, sickness, disease, drugs, accidents, or having one's life taken, whatever the means is, all of us will die. We cannot escape physical death. You know, all of us are aware also that, you know, our bodies right now, the thing that we're living in, we're breathing in, you know, we are dying. It's not just because you're old, but also if you think about it on a microscopic level, your cells are constantly dying and being replaced with new cells. Now, this body that we have is living and dying all at the same time. Now, why is that? Why do our bodies die? Well, look back at verse 10. Our body is dead because of sin. Now, as you recall, you know, the, the, the death is the consequence of sin. It goes back to the curse way, way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. When God commanded Adam and Eve, all of the trees of this garden you may eat from, except from the tree of the, garden, of the knowledge of fruit of good and evil. And for the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. And of course, Adam and Eve ate of this fruit brought into, and brought death into our world spiritual death, separation from God, no longer having a perfect relationship with God. They felt sin and guilt and shame for the first time. Physical death was promised also. Though Adam lived some 900 years later, you know, he did die. And every one of his descendants also died. An eternal death as a consequence for those who rebel against God, who live their life not seeking after God, all these three aspects of different deaths are, are included in the curse of God. But for believers, Christ takes the punishment for our sin and he transforms death from a curse into the greatest blessing that we could possibly have. Death becomes our passage into eternal life. Our entrance into our heavenly paradise, God's heavenly paradise. See, Christ used death to bring to an end this, our sin, which lingers on in our flesh. Now, I don't want to make light of your sufferings or my sufferings or anyone's loss, but the true hope that believers have is that Christ is taking our light and momentary afflictions and preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, take a look at that verse on your own and, and read and meditate on that. Or perhaps another way to say it is, you know, do you really want to live forever in this body, the body that you have? Do you really want to spend eternity in this shell? that's prone to sickness, prone to disease, prone to injury, that's prone to weakness and tiredness? You know, we spend about, you know, a third of our life sleeping. Do you want to spend a third of eternity in heaven sleeping? Do you want to keep fighting sin and temptation forever on into eternity? Of course, no, none of us want that. We need a new body. We need something that is lasting, that is immortal, that will be finally free from sin. Free from weakness. Because, you know, there are some things that you can fix and there are some things you cannot fix without replacing it all with a whole new one. And that is what Christ is doing in us. He is letting us go through life in a fallen world with suffering, with heartaches, with the weaknesses of our flesh and our physical bodies so we would all the more long and to taste of the sweetness of the life to come with God in heaven. 
See, Christ transforms death from a curse into a blessing. And he makes it the final step of our sanctification, where we will be perfected, where we will be glorified. And as one commentator has said, the day of our death becomes better than the day of our birth. Why is that? Because the day of our birth is the day we are born into sin. But the day of our death is the day that we are reborn into glory, where all of our sin, all of our troubles, all of our agitations are gone forever. We'll be perfectly whole, perfectly happy in God, having his perfect rest and peace on into eternity. The Spirit has also come. Why does the Spirit come? If we keep looking back to our first in verse 10, it's because of righteousness. The Holy Spirit gives us new eternal life through regeneration. He gives life to our bodies where otherwise we would have none. We'd be dead in sin. And He puts real and living, puts us into a real and living relationship with Christ. And it is so deep, it is so intimate that our union with our Lord is, is so deep and intimate that he imparts his own spirit, his own life into us. This is the preciousness of the gift that we have, the spirit of God, the life of Christ in us. We're also reminded that, that the life we have in Christ is because of his righteousness, his righteousness. You know, that the righteous demands of justice that God required of us. We sinned, we deserve eternity in, in hell for our sins, was paid in full by Christ living his righteous life in a way that we could never live and then dying in our place. Because we have no righteousness of our own that does not come from Christ who gives it to us fully by his grace. This is a wondrous gift, a wondrous grace that he has gives us his righteousness and his righteousness in us is being worked out, it's being matured in our life as we grow in, in, in obedience to the Spirit. He renovates our lives and our hearts and our minds and conforms us to the image of Christ. See, this is how Christians live. By the life and righteousness that Christ shares with us through his Spirit. And this changes our perspective on everything. Let me just give you an example from our most current, you know, coronavirus pandemic. I'm actually thankful that we face this because God is using this coronavirus to strip us of our idols, to force us to get really serious in our thinking about what really is important in life. No, life and death, eternity important. I mean, just consider that, you know, how many of us, we, we have the idols of sports and athletes. Well, God has shut down stadiums, fields, and arenas, so we cannot idolize those things anymore. You know, some of us idolize movie stars, we idolize musicians. Well, God has shut down the theaters, shut down Hollywood, shut down concert rooms. There's really no new, new no stuff being produced entertainment-wise. Others idolize money. We idolize the Freedom 55 retirement. Well, God has shut down the economy, made many of us lose thousands, millions. Others idolize their bodies and health. Well, God has shut down the gyms. He has shut down the spas. Others idolize education. He has shut down our schools. And yet someone insists that they have the right to murder babies in their womb. Well, God has shut down the abortion clinics, and I'm thankful to God for that. Others, you know, preach the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, the false gospel. But God has shut down, he has exposed these false prosperity gospel preachers who cannot fight and speak out of existence the, you know, the, the coronavirus as powerless charlatans crooks. So God has sent this virus to us so that we can think about things that are beyond this world. That what we worship, what we cherish, will be of eternal value. We begin to start asking these questions. Well, where will I go after we die? And where will I spend eternity? 
What will I cling to as hope as I stand before the throne of God? No questions like these need to be asked and answered. And we who have a life in Christ, we know what the answer is. And we're attested to what the answer is. The Spirit is life. Thirdly, we see that the Spirit will raise you to everlasting life. That's where Paul is going to for us in, in verse 11. He says that the Spirit of Christ who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Do you understand that? If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have his Spirit living and abiding in you, this very same Spirit who rose Jesus Christ from the grave and gave him an immortal and corruptible resurrected body will give everlasting life to your mortal body. That this body, the shell that we have, will, that is corruptible by sin, that's weak, that is prone to death, it will pass away. And our, when our spirits go to be with Christ, you know, that that's where they are. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. But when Christ returns, the same Spirit who raised Christ from the grave will raise us to, to have new glorified bodies just like Christ. This mortal, this physical body, which will decompose and return to dust in the ground, will be raised to an immortal and perishable body. And you can look at, with, look at 1 Corinthians 15 if you have more time. Just spend time reading and seeing what God has told the Apostle Paul our bodies will be like. But Paul reasons by saying this, you know, that right now, you as a Christian have a resurrected spirit. The spirit has given you new spiritual life. You have had a spiritual regeneration. But the promise is that one day, when the spirit comes, when Christ comes again, the spirit will give you a bodily resurrection, a glorified body, a physical resurrection. And just like he has recreated our spiritual bodies, he will recreate our physical, immortal bodies one day. When we think upon our Lord Jesus Christ after he, he was risen, raised from the dead. That is a prototype for all of us to follow in his footsteps who are his. So do not doubt the Holy Spirit's power. Because, you know, think about all the powers that we have discovered on this earth. Nothing comes close to giving life to the dead. This is the power that the Holy Spirit possesses, the Spirit of God, to give life to the dead. And he will, at the end of this age, raise you again by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will raise you. In the end of the age, and in this present life, he will give life to your mortal bodies to enable you, to empower you to live for Jesus. See, the Holy Spirit living and abiding in you, he guarantees that we will be raised in glory to everlasting life. So here to summarize these three verses, we see that the Holy Spirit gives life, he is life, and he will raise us to everlasting life. Let me just stop and ask you, you know, some application questions. Has the Holy Spirit led you to Christ? Has the Holy Spirit given you a new desire to honor Christ, to be pleasing to Christ? Is the Holy Spirit right now working and leading your life to become more like Jesus? Is he working in your heart and changing it so you love like Jesus loves? Now, George, what I'm getting down at is, do you have a real and complete confidence that you are a Christian? You are saved. If you're not sure, you need to ask the Holy Spirit, please show me, reveal to me, put into my mind, and show me the transforming work that you are doing in my life. Show me the fruit of my life. Recall to me what I used to be like and that what I am now. And give me that assurance. Help me to know that and trust that. You make me thankful. Perhaps you are also listening or you're watching. You know that you are not saved. 
You know you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the Holy Spirit is calling out to you to come. Come to Jesus and give your life to Christ. Come confessing your sins. Come, come surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as Lord. Believe that he died on the cross in your place. And receive his forgiveness. Receive his love. Receive his grace. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so you can become a, a Christian and live for Him. For those of you who struggle in your faith, let me ask you this. How healthy are you spiritual? Do you have a robust, spiritual, healthy, spiritual life? So let me remind you, the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead and will one day raise you from the dead is a living in you is he helping you resist and overcome sin is he helping prepare you to grow in holiness so you're ready for heaven because just as our physical bodies now first sick we're prone to sickness we have you know less power to fight disease when we're sick but a healthy spiritual life is less prone to sin and has greater power to fight temptation. See, the Spirit will work in your life to make you more like Christ. But if you're not spending time every day in the Word and in prayer, you're not spiritually healthy. You will be prone to sin. You will be prone to temptation. You will feel lethargic. You will be lazy and apathetic towards the things of God. And all the good, wonderful things that God wants to do in your life through our, our pandemic of the, 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 this providential time will amount to nothing without this healthy spiritual diet of prayer in the Word. We need to be in the Bible and in prayer every day. Uh, I may be preaching to the choir, some of you here, but I'm preaching to you, you young person. You who think, oh, I don't need Jesus. I'm just going to, you know, it's another thing on my to-do list or whatever. i got other things to do. No, you need to listen up. You need to be in your Bible. You need to be reading your Bible and praying every day. I mean, how many Bibles do you have on you? How many... That, Bible apps that you have on your phone that will help you to grow and be healthy. I'm also preaching to you, seasoned Christian. Now I know that you're no longer here with us. We cannot gather as a church together and be fed the Word of God and fellowship together, but you on your own must be in the Word and in prayer to grow. Preaching to you, pastor, myself, pastor, you, church leader. You in the word every day? Are you reading and growing and nourishing your life? So that whenever we come back together, we will have grown, we will have become what God wants to be us to be as a church when we gather again. And if you need help with that, if you lack that, you know, that accountability, you can call me, you can message me, you can talk to Jason as well. We'll help find you an accountability group in our discipleship group so we can grow together. We can help one another through our social distances, through our video means to encourage one another to become like Christ and grow so the Spirit can work in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your Spirit who gives us life, who is life, and he will raise us one day. Lord, we ask that Pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would cleanse us for all the times we have wandered off on our own. We have neglected the important things of prayer and the word and what you have called us to be in loving our families and loving our church and loving and preaching the gospel to our neighbors. Lord, help us. Help us to, to put to death, to smash those idols that we trust in, those things that occupy so much of our time so we can give up ourselves the things that are of our eternal value, eternal worth. And Lord, if there are any who are watching, anyone who are listening, who have not Jesus Christ, who know not Jesus Christ, I pray, Holy Spirit, please convict the heart of their sin, their need for righteousness, and their need for Christ. And awaken them, draw them to yourself, and 
saved and caused them to be born again. Live in them. In them. Lord, along with your Son and your God. We ask this in the name of Jesus.